we'll begin now. Um, so good evening, everyone, and thank you for, uh, for participating in our webinar tonight. Uh, on behalf of the Canadian Breast Cancer Network, I'd like to welcome you to our educational webinar on the latest metastatic breast cancer treatment. My name is Craig Foss, and I'm the Operations Manager with the Canadian Breast Cancer Network, and I'm pleased to be your moderator for today's session. We would like to thank our partners at ASI for, this, uh, webinar, for, for making this webinar possible through an educational grant. Before we begin, I would like to take a few minutes to provide an overview of the agenda for this evening. Our expert speaker, Dr. Stephen Chia, will share his presentation, which will be followed by the opportunity for participants to ask questions. You will notice a question box at the right-hand corner of your screen. You can submit questions by typing them into this box either throughout the presentation or at the end. The webinar will last for one hour and will be finished by 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, or Daylight Time. Please know that today's webinar will be recorded to allow for on-demand viewing. You'll be able to view the recording on our website at cbcn.ca. Lastly, an email will be sent to you in the next 24 hours asking you to complete an evaluation of this evening's webinar. This will only take a minute or two of your time, and we greatly appreciate your feedback as it directly impacts future programming. So without further delay, I would like to uh, welcome our expert speaker for this evening, Dr. Stephen Chia. Dr. Chia is an Associate Professor of Medicine in the, in the Department of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. He is also a staff oncologist with the British Columbia Cancer Agency in Vancouver. In addition, Dr. Chia serves as the Chair for the British Columbia Breast Tumor Group and is a Physician Coordinator for both breast cancer and head and neck cancer clinical trials at the BCCA, Vancouver Cancer Center. He currently sits on the NCIC Clinical Trials Committee Executive, the NCIC CTG Breast Executive, and the NCIC CTG Breast uh, Correlative Sciences Committee. Welcome, Dr. Chia. Thank you for joining us this evening, and I will now turn the session over to you. Thank you, Craig. And uh, thank you to the Canadian Breast Cancer Network for putting on these educational events um, in regards to, I think, very varied and important aspects as it relates to um, women and men, but predominantly women in this country, faced, uh, either facing or at risk for breast cancer. Um, I was asked to speak about some of the new therapies available for the treatment of breast cancer, but focusing specifically on the new treatments of advanced or what we use the term metastatic breast cancer. So. Um, what I'd like to do in the next 40 minutes is to go over a few things uh, and then leave ample time for questions because I'm very, um, very much, I, I find in previous experiences uh, there's a fair bit of questions often come through and I will do my very best to answer all of the questions that you ask. Um, as I mentioned, over 40 minutes, I want to just touch on a few things. Uh, one of them is just a general principle uh, a review or information in regards to what impact we are really having in the research and clinical community of treating metastatic disease. Talk about several different new agents as it relates to what I call specific subtypes of breast cancer that we are, are seeing now. And then talk specifically about potentially the trials uh, and then how we might think about selecting patients for the different treatments. The first thing I think is a really important concept to convey uh, to, most importantly, to patients that I see in my clinic, that I see uh, that I see face to face with stage four or metastatic breast cancer, but also very importantly to um, provincial payees and to the research community, and that is the question is, is the new treatment that is being researched and funded across our publicly funded healthcare system? Make an Im making an impact for women with that stage of disease. So in British Columbia, we do have, uh, I think, a, a fairly well-established publicly funded healthcare system for cancer and an organized cancer program throughout the province. We looked over the 1990s to early 2000s as we introduced new drugs to treat metastatic breast cancer if, in fact, women who were receiving the new drugs were actually living longer. So we chose four specific time points as to when we released or had uh, public funding for these newer drugs, as you see here, paclitaxel, docetaxel, capecitabine. And we were, in fact, one of the first to show from a population basis that women with metastatic disease are living longer 
in the early 2000s than they were 10 years before that in the 1990s. And you can see this here by the curves. The gray line is these women who were diagnosed from 1999 to 2001 versus the green and the blue line where they're diagnosed in the earlier decade. Uh, so we were able to show that women with stage 4 disease are living longer, and it's potentially linked to the introduction and the use of newer treatments for advanced stage disease. Now, we often in the medical community, you know, rely on our pathologists to tell us that this is a diagnosis of breast cancer, and this is often what they show us or what they look at under the microscope. This is called the standard HNE, where um, uh, whether a biopsy or a resection of the breast cancer is taken at the time of surgery, placed into paraffin, and then looked at under the microscope. So this is, a, this is an actual demonstration of a breast cancer. But I think as we move forward, what we are using the terminology or the description is actually best described when we understand what's going on in the tumor. So this is uh, based on work initially described by um, a gentleman by the name of Chuck Peru, but now it's been well established in the literature that when you look at thousands of genes, so here on the um, y-axis are different genes, that in fact that breast cancer is quite uniquely different potentially from one woman to another, but that you can still group them based on similar changes within subgroups that we use the term luminal A and luminal B. And these, in fact, are your, your hormone receptor or your estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. Then there's the HER2 breast cancers, and then the basal-like breast cancer, which is essentially a subgroup within the term triple negative breast cancers. So what I would like to do is then focus the talk on various treatments that have emerged for these subgroups of breast cancer. The other point I want to make is that it's also been shown that the demonstration or the segregation of these subgroups is associated with differential outcomes, the term we use, prognosis. So let's just spend a few minutes talking about the HER2 positive subgroup. And uh, basically, we know that this subgroup has too much of this receptor called HER2 on the surface of the breast cancer. And as many of you know, now know, we have drugs that target this specific receptor, and they're called antibodies against HER2, of which the, the one that we are most established in using in both early and advanced stage breast cancers called trastuzumab or Herceptin is the trade name. But now, there, and I'll show you the data, there's a demonstration that there is another antibody called pertuzumab, or the trade name um, Pergetta, which will, I will demonstrate to you that giving two antibodies is better than giving one. So that's based on this clinical trial called the Cleopatra study, where they studied 800-some women, all with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer, never receiving chemotherapy yet in the advanced stage setting, and they got randomized to getting standard treatment today, which is Herceptin or Trastuzumab plus chemotherapy, and the drug given here was Dulcetaxol, or the combination of Pertuzumab, Trastuzumab, and Dulcetaxol. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a large trial of 808 women, and it was an, uh, a trial across the world, um, and included about three-quarters or 80% of these women had evidence of disease in their um, organs, such as their lung or their liver. First, first thing to note from this trial is that giving two antibodies rather than one with chemotherapy prolonged the time before the cancer got worse and there needed to be a change in the treatment. So that's the term we use called progression-free survival. And in fact, it improved by an, uh, an absolute or difference of six months from 12 and a half months with Herceptin to 18 and a half by giving pertuzumab and trastuzumab, the two antibodies. As importantly, however, this study also demonstrated now there is an improvement in overall survival for these women with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer, and that these women now are living beyond four years, getting close to uh, four and a half, if not getting closer uh, to um, five years, of survival from the time of which they entered the trial. Now, we as 
clinicians and researchers often look to see, is there groups of patients within the study that had either more or less benefit to treatment? And this is the term called the forest plot. And basically, you can see everything with the line here is really to the left of one and really all somewhat similar in terms of the range of where they are on this x-axis, basically demonstrating that the benefit is is really across all subgroups or types of patients that they saw on the study. The other thing that's important to note is that this benefit that was seen on the study is not at the expense of giving more chemotherapy. So remember that this study was given on a backbone of chemotherapy called docetaxel, but in fact, across the two arms, the amount of chemotherapy was similar at eight cycles across both. So the benefit was not from giving more chemo that potentially comes with more toxicity, but in fact by giving the two antibodies rather than one. Now, there is increased side effects by giving two antibodies rather than one, so it is important to note that in particular there's more diarrhea, more rash, um, more what we call inflammation of the mucosa, and a few more of these other things such as potentially fever, dry skin, uh, et cetera. So one does need to balance that with the benefit that we see to have a discussion with the patient that there is um, some increased side effects with this combination. Um, but in fact, the, the, the really the serious ones that we pay attention to, the only ones that were higher was that of what we call febrile neutropenia, so fever associated with the uh, chemotherapy and the antibodies and diarrhea. But importantly, there was no difference in heart effects or cardiac side effects, which you know does happen with the anti-HER2 antibodies. Now, the other drug I want to mention briefly uh, for um, this type of breast cancer, HER2 positive, is a drug called TDM1. And this is the first in the class that we see, but it won't be the last because the concept is really exciting. And that is giving the antibody here, which is trastuzumab herceptin, but linking chemotherapy to it. So essentially trying to bring the chemotherapy more targeted to the cancer cells. And by doing so, it releases the chemotherapy more specifically in these cells and potentially then lessen the side effects in, in the normal cells in, a, in an individual's uh, body. So the basis for this drug and the use of this drug is what's called the Emilia study. Again, a very large trial of close to 1,000 patients where they had previously received treatment with both trastuzumab and chemotherapy and ataxane, and they get randomized to this new drug called TDM1 or our previous standard drugs called capecitabine and lapatinib, so two oral treatments. Again, a large trial uh, enrolling patients across the world, uh, and the uh, vast majority of the patients, 90%, had already had one line of treatment in the metastatic setting. This trial does demonstrate an improvement. Again, in this term we use progression-free survival, which means the, the time to which the cancer gets worse, where there needs to patients uh, need to come off study and require a change in treatment. Um, that there was an improvement of six, from 6.4 months for the previous standard of lapatinib capecitabine to an improvement of nine and a half months. So it's about a three month absolute difference for this TDM1. This study also showed that there was an overall survival benefit to give this what we call antibody drug conjugate. Uh, again, when we look at the subgroups, or what we call the, 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 the characteristics of either the tumor or the patient that might suggest whether there's more or less benefit, again, when we use this, this assessment or illustration called the forest plots, you can see that pretty well the treatment is similar uh, to the left of this, this dotted line. Um, the other thing of principle with these antibody drug conjugates is that in fact, it does demonstrate that there is less toxicity by delivering the drug more specifically to these cancer cells. So in general, when we use the terminology grade three or higher adverse event, there was a higher, or well, I'll use the word a lower rate with the TDM1 versus the patative and the capecitabine. Now, it's 
I can't say that there is no side effects with this drug called TDM1, because in fact there is. There's a different spectrum and quantification of side effect. So when I tell my patients what to potentially expect or be aware of if they are going on this treatment, it includes thrombocytopenia, which is low platelet, increased AST and ALT, which means slightly elevated liver enzymes, and anemia, which is a drop in hemoglobin. This is relative to the side effects that we see with the lepatidip and capecitabine, which is diarrhea, hand foot syndrome, vomiting, neutropenia. So that in is, I think, what I want to highlight as the two therapies that have made a significant impact today for HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer. Um, and in fact, those drugs uh, for most provinces across this country are publicly funded. So what I want to move to next is the subgroup that we call luminal B. So that's the, that's the teal line that you see here that's, that's dotted. Uh, and that, that luminal B um, uh, is, as I mentioned, a group within the hormone receptor positive breast cancers. Now, we are now have the ability to look more at depth in individual tumors to see what changes there are at the DNA or the gene level. And when we do that, we, we, dem we were, ab were able to, and this has been published now, demonstrate that, in fact, hormone receptor or luminal breast cancers have quite a lot of different changes. But the single most um, frequent change in luminal breast cancers is in a gene called PI3 kinase. And why is that important? That's important because PI3K, so that's that second bubble on your a graph here called PI3K, is instrumental in this pathway called PI3 mTOR pathway. And this pathway is involved in allowing cells to survive, cells to grow, and involved in the metabolism and the protein synthesis of cancer cells. And because this pathway is the most frequently altered in luminal breast cancers, there's tremendous interest in blocking this pathway. Um, and so what's demonstrated here is just the names of different drugs that are being studied or uh, in clinical research right now uh, trying to block different parts of this pathway. And the one drug I want to focus a little bit of time on is a drug called Everolimus that you see down on your left-hand side, which is an mTOR inhibitor that blocks this lower end of the pathway called mTOR1. So that is based on this trial called the Bolero 2 study. So the Bolero 2 study is, again, a large trial of stage 4 ER-positive HER2-negative metastatic breast cancer. And all patients had previously received a drug called letrozole or anastrozole. So those are called the non steroidal aromatase inhibitors. And they were randomized to either another hormonal drug called exemestane or another drug called exemestane plus everolimus. And as I demonstrated in this previous slide, everolimus is an mTOR inhibitor. So this is, this is the design of the study. Now, what the study showed is that there was a benefit to give the everolimus in combination with the hormonal drug, uh, exemestane, and in fact, there was a close to a doubling in this terminology, again, of progression-free survival. So again, a doubling before the cancer got worse on the study patients, before they either had to come off the study uh, or, and receive a change in treatment. And that with just the exemestane alone, we can barely achieve three months. But with these two drugs of Everolimus and Exemestane, you more than double that to 7.8 months. Now, again, if we try to look at different subgroups where we might see more or less benefits, so again, viscera is if there is involvement in the organs like lung or liver. Non-viscera means there's no involvement of those organs, and bone only is, is it's describes as in the bone, you can see that the magnitude of benefit is very similar across all these subtypes or, or characteristics. So it's not that we can choose and say, oh, this situation means that you'll get more benefit versus not having the situation means not. 
More recently, however, the study did not show that there was an overall survival benefit. Now, numerically, there was a difference. And if you actually go back to the original study, you see that there's difference that we see um, was about four and a half months, right? So from 3.2 to 7.8 is about 4.6 months. And that in overall survival, though this was not statistically significant, so we, we look at what's called the log rank p-value of 0.14, we want to see it below 0.05, but the Everell's menexamestane arm did numerically still have a longer overall survival compared to the placebo, and that difference was about four and a half months. So many of us in, the, in this uh, field feel that there was still some prolongation, though it just did not reach statistical significance, that might be a carryover or maintenance from the benefit that we saw in the progression-free survival. Now, how does this compare to previous studies that have been done with just hormonal therapy alone. And that's what I'm showing here on this slide of other studies like EFFECT, SOFIA, or CONFIRM. And you can see that numerically for the Everolimus and Exmestane arm that this combination here of 31 months is longer than we have seen with other trials. So again, going back to my point that I demonstrated at the beginning, that we are seeing women live longer today with stage breast cancer, metastatic breast cancer, and in my belief, because of newer treatments that have demonstrated a survival impact. Now, um, the other endpoint that was collected on this study was that there was an, a, a delay to the time of use of chemotherapy. So in my practice, I would say a number of my patients do tell me that it is important if we can delay the time before things get worse um, or in requiring chemotherapy. And this study demonstrated that by giving the Everolimus and Exmestane, you doubled that time from six months to approximately 12 months. That's it, Fid? Okay. Hello? Hello? Uh, yeah. Was there, did somebody have a question there or something? Um, so, the other thing, though, as I've demonstrated in the other drugs that we've talked about, is that there is a difference in toxicity. And I'd have to say here, with the Everolimus and Exmestane, there is increased side effects that patients and physicians need to be aware of, need to be proactive about, and need to have a really balanced discussion that is it worth adding this drug, which does prolong the time before the cancer gets worse, but there is added toxicities, in particular things like stomatitis, which is sores in the mouth, a rash, and fatigue. Those are the most common ones. Very rarely, we also see something called pneumonitis, which is an inflammation in the lung. And because this pathway is involved in glucose metabolism, there's also the side effect called hyperglycemia, or high sugars. Now, just to demonstrate that, with the stomatitis or sores in the mouth, we do know that the onset of this is pretty rapid. It happens in the first six to eight weeks. So in my experience, I see patients before treatment, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, and eight weeks, and typically by eight weeks, if they don't have it, they don't tend to have it. On the other hand, this risk for inflammation along called pneumonitis can happen gradually over time. But the rate of which it's significant, it's still less than 5%. Because this trial was placebo, meaning that half the, or actually a third of the patients on the trial received just the hormonal drug, they did collect quality of life measures. And, and despite the increased side effects, we do see that there was still a better quality of life on treatment with Everolimus and Exemestane than there was with just the placebo. The other, the other agent I want to briefly mention that uh, people may be aware of is, is a class of drugs called CDK4, cyclin-dependent kinase 4 slash 6 inhibitors. So this class of drugs is involved in what we call the cells progress, uh, cell proliferation, or the cells turning over more quickly. And by blocking CDK4-6, you block the rate of which cells turn over. So that was the concept of this trial uh, that gave patients with ER-positive metastatic breast cancer, hormonal therapy alone with letrozole, or the drug called PD-033-2991, which the, the name is now called palbocyclib, together with letrozole. 
And basically, this study has now been has been published and has demonstrated that, again, this drug essentially doubles the time. It goes from approximately 11 months to 18 months for the addition of this CDK4-6 flash inhibitor to letrozole versus letrozole alone. It is a smaller study called the randomized phase two. Uh, and so the overall survival in the study was not statistically significant. And we are awaiting the confirmatory phase three trial called Coloma two to demonstrate that. The FDA United States, in fact, has given preliminary um, license to, for, for this drug to start to hit the market in the United States. Very briefly then, I want to talk about the next subtype called luminal A. And in fact, this subtype is one that tends to have a better prognosis, but there is still the proportion of these breast cancers, luminal A, that present or ultimately develop stage four or metastatic breast cancer, and thus treatments are still required. And one of the treatments that I think we're focusing on is just, is potentially just one of the questions is, is what sequence of using just even our standard hormonal drugs might be better. And that study is called the FIRST study. And this study is comparing fulvestrant to um, anastrozole. So these are two hormonal drugs. One of them given intramuscularly, binds to the estrogen receptor, causes it to downregulate. The other, anastrozole, which is an aromatase inhibitor, basically reduces the estrogen production in a postmenopausal woman. Now, this study, the reason why I want to focus that it predominantly looks to be a luminal A breast cancer is what's unique about the study is about 70% of breast cancer, 70% uh, of patients on the study had not had any previous therapy for their breast cancer to get on the study. And in fact, potentially giving the fulvestrant, again, doubled the time for um, before things got worse compared to anastrozole. So it went from 13 months to 24 months. And more recently, the study was demonstrated, again, this is a smaller, what's called a randomized phase two study, that in fact there was a suggestion of a survival benefit. And again, it was with a fulvestrant, the survival was about 54 months compared to 48 months for the anastrozole. And what I wanted to highlight here in the red box on the lower part of the slide is that, again, trying to show you that with more, with women participating in these trials in the more modern setting, this is the first study, that numerically it looks like the survival is getting longer. In fact, on both arms, but also the, one of the longer survivals noted is in the fulvestrant arm. So these, again, all bode well to, I, I believe, better treatments overall, not only just drug treatments, but supportive care treatments in the metastatic setting. And I believe a lot of this has to do with access to, to new drugs that have demonstrated improvements through research. Now, this study, again, as I mentioned, was a randomized phase two, so it's a, a smaller study, and we are waiting the phase three trial called FALCON, which is a definitive study to demonstrate in, if, in fact, fulvestrin should be the first drug used in the metastatic setting particularly in patients that have not received any hormonal therapy, because that's what the stipulation for the study is. This study has been fully accrued, and we will be awaiting results in the next uh, year or longer. The last thing I want to focus then is, is, the, is the basal. So the basal is the HER2. That is the, sorry, the basal is one that is negative in estrogen and negative in HER2. So there is no role for hormonal treatment and there is no role for anti-HER2 treatment. And essentially what we are left with in this group of patients called basal-like or triple negative breast cancers is chemotherapy. And I want to, I'll first of all talk about one chemotherapy drug, and I, I, I actually didn't incorporate the slides, but I just want to touch base on it for a moment, and then touch base on a more recent study that was demonstrated a few months ago in San Antonio. So as I mentioned to you, the, the, we are using standard chemotherapy drugs in this, in this um, subtype of breast cancer. And in fact, we also will use chemotherapy for the luminal B breast cancers, and I just didn't uh, have time to demonstrate that as well. And one of the more newer drugs that have come out over the last couple years is a drug called um, arubilin. So arubilin is 
a drug that's called a spindle poison, and it actually is a, is a better formulation or version than previous spindle poisons that we've had. And in a large trial that, uh, that was an international trial, it demonstrated that using arubilin when patients had previously had sort of drugs that we, more, we use more in the, in the earlier setting, which is called anthracyclines and taxanes, that there was a survival benefit to give arubilin compared to what physicians could choose from a, different, a number of different drugs. So that is a key standard chemotherapy drug that is funded across many provinces in this country, and, I, and it does have an impact in the survival um, for uh, uh, particularly basal-like breast cancers, or triple negative, but also in general for, for advanced disease that have previously received chemotherapy, including luminal B breast cancers treated with both hormones and chemotherapy. Now, the other thing I wanted to highlight was more recently uh, a trial that, again, looks at standard chemotherapy, and it's a drug that maybe, I think, in the past is not a class of drugs that has not been used as frequently, but I think you will see more being used in triple negative or basal breast cancers, and it's a drug called carboplatinum. This is a, a class of drugs called platinums, and it's used very standardly in other types of cancers like lung cancers, ovarian cancers. So this was a study done in the United Kingdom comparing uh, a standard drug called docetaxel or taxane versus carboplatinum. It's really asking the sequence, which one do you use first? And this was uh, a relatively large trial, almost 400 women with triple negative breast cancers. Um, and you can see triple negative breast cancers typically occur in a younger age of patients in their mid-50s, but the range is, is there. Um, sorry. So this, this study, I'm just going to jump to this slide, showed, in fact, that giving the carboplatinum um, did not have any difference compared to the docetaxel, if you use carboplatinum versus docetaxel first. Now, you might say, then why are you showing this to me? What, what does it matter if there's no difference? Though there's no difference in what we call progression-free survival, there actually was a difference in toxicity. So, in fact, things like um, neuropathy, which is numbness and tingling, diarrhea, risk for fever infection and infection, rash and, and mucositis were all less with a platinum versus docetaxel. So it is important that we balance quality of life, and if we have drugs that produce similar outcomes but have less side effects, then it, it, I think it, it does lend a lot of credence to consider these drugs in this, in this specific situation. The other interest that they have is that, that specifically in those breast cancers that seem to be caused by an alteration in BRC1 or 2, so we call these BRC1 or 2 uh, mutated breast cancers, we know that these breast cancers have um, uh, inability or, or problem in repairing DNA damage. And because carboplatinum is what we call a DNA damaging agent, there's been a lot of interest that this class of drugs has more activity for this type of breast cancer called BRCA1 or 2, altered or mutated. In fact, this, this study does show that, that these types of cancers were more sensitive to carboplatinum when there was a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. Um, the last thing I want to just highlight is uh, right now where we're moving to. Now, in triple negative or basal breast cancers, as I highlighted, chemotherapy will remain the backbone. And I talked about arubilin, and I talked about a drug called carboplatinum. And we don't have what we call targeted drugs like hormone, hormonal agents or anti-HER2 agents. But where there is a lot of interest in oncology right now is trying to better harness the immune system. And we recognize that, in fact, what cancer cells sometimes do, do is they shut down our immune system to attack those cancer cells. So there is a lot of interest, and, and that mechanism of shutting down our, our own inner recognition of cancer cells is the PDL1 and PD1 um, pathway. 
and these are involved in what's called T cell recognition and recognition of cancer cells or what we call proteins on cancer cells. So what um, a lot of interest and enthusiasm by both patients and the, can and the research community is in trying to, to overcome this loss of immunity, at least in regard to cancer cell recognition. So there is going to be quite an, 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 a, a, an interest and trials going on with antibodies that block PDL1 or block PD1. And I can tell you that uh, we in British Columbia will be um, in the next couple months opening a study for triple negative breast cancers with an antibody against PDL1. Other companies also have drugs that block either PD1, PDL1, or uh, involved in uh, immune regulation. Um, the last thing I wanted to touch upon is, is something that I think is it's important to consider, and, and that is just the more holistic view of treatment of breast cancer. And even though, as a medical oncologist, I give a lot of drugs as the treatment of breast cancer, it's also important to acknowledge and be aware that, you know, there is a holistic view to this. So I, I just wanted to bring this, even though this is actually not specifically about stage four metastatic breast cancer, I do think it actually translates to all stages of breast cancer. So this was a study published a couple of years ago looking at mindful-based stress reduction in, in quality of life and dealing with quality of life aspects as it relates to a diagnosis of breast cancer. And this was a randomized trial of 229 women. It's an eight-week program of mindful-based stress reduction really following the philosophy of Kabat-Zinn, and I'll talk about that in a moment. What that involves is meditation, body scanning, yoga, didactic lectures, group discussions, and home practice. And what the study showed by doing this type of inner reflection and mindful-based study, uh, mindful-based stress reduction, there was improvements in mood, um, quality of life uh, indices of both breast cancer and endocrine measures that lasted out to three months. Uh, when they were assessed. Kabat-Zinn was um, a professor of medicine emeritus at, uh, uh, at the University of Massachusetts, and, and he um, has published a lot in terms of uh, stress reduction. Uh, a lot of that is based on Buddhism, uh, et cetera, and he has published books that uh, you may or may not be aware of called Wherever You Go or There You Go. But this was the basis of the development of something called mindful-based stress reduction. And, and it is something that I, I do mention to many of my patients, particularly if I feel that this might be helpful with dealing with some of the stressors and anxiety of a diagnosis of breast cancer. And again, I, uh, it, I discuss it with patients with all stages of breast cancer. So just to summarize, uh, I do think that New therapies for metastatic breast cancer are improving survival in Canadian women. I try to break it down in terms of subtypes of breast cancer because that is what your physician or oncologist, if, if you in the audience uh, are, happen to be a patient with breast cancer, do look upon. For the HER2 positive subtype, we used antibodies or antibody drug conjugates, things like percuzumab and TDM1, in addition to standard therapies like taxanes and trastuzumab. In our luminal or what we call uh, uh, ER-positive breast cancers, the backbone remains hormonal therapy, but we are seeing targeted drugs added to that, whether they be mTOR inhibitors like everolimus or CDK5-6 inhibitors like palbocyclib or others. Um, right now, for basal or triple negative breast cancers, the standard of care remains chemotherapy, and there remain these classes of drugs that we use, anthracyclines, taxanes, drugs like arubilin, and then, as I mentioned to you or demonstrated to you, the class of drugs like platinum. We, will, we need to improve on those, and that's where the field of immunotherapy has a focus right now in triple negative breast cancers. I'm not saying that there might not be a role in either the HER2 or the luminal or ER positive, but I, the feeling is that there seems to be um, uh, more 
uh, involvement of immune modulation for triple negative basal-like breast cancers. And it's likely that they will be add-ons to chemotherapy um, or following chemotherapy for prolonging maintenance or keeping the disease in uh, minimal residual disease because um, chemotherapy will still remain a backbone for that subtype of breast cancer. And lastly, the ongoing research and commitment is really needed by all partners dealing with this disease. So us in the research community, clinicians, and most importantly, patients. And I can tell you from my experience of, of doing clinical trials, being involved in clinical trials here at the Cancer Agency as well as at the national level, it is a very high priority and patients are extremely positive and energetic, enthusiastic about participating in trials. And I think by doing so, we can only move the field forward faster. So I want to thank the CBCN for arranging this. I want to thank Eastside Canada for an unrestricted educational grant for, for, for putting on an awareness about metastatic breast cancer. Uh, I promised you it would be under 45 min or 40 minutes, which it was, so we have uh, time here for questions, and uh, I will pass it back uh, off now to CBCN. Thank you, Dr. Chia, uh, for your informative presentation, for sharing your expertise and knowledge with us. Uh, as Dr. Chu said, I would now like to welcome participants to submit their questions by typing them into the question box in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, please note that we'll be not able to provide any specific treatment recommendations through this webinar. These should be discussed with your primary care physician. Uh, we will try to take as many questions as possible. However, we may not be able to get through them all due to time constraints, but we do have quite a bit of time here, so hopefully we can get through most. Um, so we do have a question uh, starting here. I'm just going to move the screen out so we, I can see it a bit better. Um, so first one is, um, thank you, Dr. Chia. In your view, what are the most interesting research projects for heavily treated hormone-positive cancers, i.e., after all, the hormone treatments have been exhausted? Yeah, so, you know, I think that um, the the areas that I touched on was this pathway called the PI3 pathway. So uh, there are ongoing research with what's called PI3 kinase inhibitors. So what I did show you was a drug called Everolimus, which was an mTOR inhibitor. But there is a lot of interest in using blocking it higher up in the pathway. So um, multiple companies have PI3 kinase inhibitors combining with hormonal therapy. The other class was what I mentioned, the CDK4-6 inhibitors. And in fact, there's now going to be, uh, there's a study that um, is likely moving forward of combining hormonal therapy with both classes of drugs, both a PI3 kinase inhibitor, a CDK4-6 slash 6 inhibitor. Um, the other class of, the other sort of, quote, targeted class of drugs that is being looked at is um, called HDAC inhibitors. Uh, so these are classes of drugs that affect chromatin remodeling of the DNA and may allow the DNA to open up to be uh, uh, more accessible for um, expression of certain genes. And there's been some preliminary, again, a small phase two study demonstrating this class of drugs might have activity in, again, uh, previously treated hormone-positive breast cancer. So there are trials going on moving forward with that as well. Great. Thank you. Another question from a participant is, any thoughts on the finesse or lucitanabib trial? Um, the participant's about to join on April 7th at Prince Margaret Hospital. Um, I, we don't, we're not participating in the finesse trial, so I'm not familiar with that. Um, uh, so if you have more information, please elaborate. I'd be happy to, 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 to discuss about that. Uh, PMH is clearly uh, one of the uh, uh, largest and uh, leading cancer centers in, in Canada. And I, um, I, I would be very confident that at your recommendation of your oncologist, this would be uh, a, a potentially suitable study for you. Great. Another question, um, that was all that I had for that question. If there's any follow-up, please uh, submit it, and we'll try to get back to it if we have time. Uh, another question is, has there been any progress on finding drugs that cross the brain-blood barrier? 
the participant has HER2 positive breast cancer and have done really well on Herceptin, but have not at least uh, but have not had at least one brain tumor. But have had at least one brain tumor. Sorry. Yeah. So this is a very good question. Um, it, you know, there are definitely. Uh, we always need to strive to make improvements. Even though I demonstrated in the HER2 positive uh, a subtype, you know, improving survivals and new drugs, we still have definite challenges. And one of them is um, cancers that involve the brain and, and uh, you know, brain cause brain metastases. There, um, you know, I, I think at present we don't have a, a good traction on new drugs crossing the blood-brain barrier and having more of an impact for brain metastases. Where the field is moving to, at least right now, is better treating the brain metastases with either surgery or this area of called radial surgery, so giving stereotactic or higher dose radiation specifically to those spots. Um, and so there's uh, a lot of there's a number of studies and new machines that are able to deliver more specifically located radiation to those areas. This is clearly an area that we need to continue to um, to work on, find drugs that cross the blood brain barrier, um, and um, uh, potentially uh, do research and enroll patients with this. And I completely agree. Um, there's been some case reports in the literature of actually giving Herceptin. Uh, into the uh, into the fluid around the brain called the CSF. Uh, I think that this area is still in its infancy and it's encouraging for the case reports, but I think we do need to have more evidence. Um, and I personally haven't done it yet, but I'm waiting for more evidence to demonstrate the safety and also the role of it. Um, we actually have another question uh, regarding in the same kind of category. Um, and maybe you've already kind of answered a lot of this already, but are there any news for brain met breast cancer? Yeah, yeah, no. So basically, as I mentioned, you know, really looking at um, the radiation doctors are, I think, more willing to consider giving uh, what we call stereotactic uh, radiation to more than just a few lesions. And when we first, when they first do, started doing this several years ago, they would restrict it to maybe three or less lesions, and now they're looking at, at giving this to more than three lesions. It really is dependent on the site of where uh, you're being treated and the radiation oncologist there, there, there. There isn't necessarily a standard, I would say, and many of these are being done under research protocols, which is important. Um, the um, uh, other, there definitely are, there, there's a hope that these smaller drugs might have, so, so these drugs that I've talked about, you know, Everolimus is one example, but these other drugs coming forward like PI3 kinase inhibitors and et cetera may have some ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. The reason I say that is one of the side effects that we've noticed from the PI3 kinase inhibitors, in fact, is mood disturbance in a small proportion. But that that toxicity, as, as unfortunate or we don't want to see, but it actually does demonstrate that the drugs might cross, cross the blood-brain barrier and cause some effects there in the brain. So there is some hope that these newer drugs called PS3 kinase inhibitors, and we don't know yet about the CDK4-6, but others might, in fact, cross the blood-brain barrier. And that, that information will come forward more in these research studies. Great. Thank you. Um, Another question is, thank you uh, for such an informative session. Can you say if there's a recommended duration of HER2-targeted therapy in metastatic patients with stable tumor and no side effects or toxicity with regard to Herceptin or Herceptin plus Progetta? Yeah, so again, a really good question. And so what I tried to show in the Cleopatra, that was the first study I showed of giving the two antibodies, the pertuzumab and the trastuzumab, was um, what they did on the study and what, uh, what we do here in clinical practice is as long as patients are tolerating the treatment, willing to undergo the treatment, and the cancer remains under control, it's not getting worse, we would continue the antibodies indefinitely. Um, and I can tell you that I've heard from uh, uh, clinicians that have put patients on this study called Cleopatra that there are some women that remain on the antibodies for years, uh, five plus years, with their disease under control, continuing on with the antibodies. Now, obviously, that's, that would be great to see and is optimistic. 
It's the range, so we don't see that in all situations, unfortunately, but we definitely do see that in a proportion of patients. Thank you. Um, this is a follow-up to the finesse uh, trial question. Uh, are you aware of uh, any studies addressing FGFR1 amplification uh, besides the uh, finesse uh, Lustanabib trial or uh, um, 11Q13 amplification? Yeah, so the FGFR amplification, so that is in, in the luminal or hormone receptor positive breast cancers, um, FGF is another receptor that we see, and it's felt to, to um, be involved in ca uh, causing cells to potentially progress. About 10% of luminal breast cancers, a little bit under that, have FGFR. We do have drugs that block it. Um, and so there is some interest that the combination of these inhibitors called FGF inhibitors plus hormonal therapy or in some situations alone might cause stabilization of disease. Um, so clearly if there is an alteration, there is a suggestion that these drugs might be of benefit, but clearly that's why the studies need to be done. In terms of 11Q13 ampli uh, amplification or alteration, that that is work that's actually been demonstrated to is demonstrated to be associated with um, a, a worse outcome in luminal or ER positive breast cancers, and um, you know work is just undergoing to try to to understand the reason why and overcome that um, negative impact. Um, I apologize if I mispronounce one of the word, uh, one of the terms here, but I'll try my best. Um, I've heard that uh, capsaicinabine uh, may cross the blood-brain barrier and have some effect on brain meth. Uh, so that is correct. So capecitabine is one of the chemotherapy drugs that we, we do use standardly. It's the advantage of capecitabine, it's oral. It's given twice a day for two weeks in general and then a week off. Um, and I found in my experience it, it, it can be a very um, effective drug, uh, particularly in the luminal breast cancers like the luminal A, but we, we often use it in luminal B and even in triple negative. Um, there definitely has been anecdotal case reports that it might cross the blood-brain barrier and have some effect in brain met. It's very, um, it's variable, and there's not clear what impact it has. As I mentioned, there's case reports, but there are, I can tell you in my experience, I unfortunately haven't seen that same benefit, but it's definitely worth considering if there is really limited options otherwise. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, that actually uh, is the last question I have in the Q and A in the queue here. Uh, if there's anyone else who has a, another question, we still have a few more minutes left. Uh, if you want to try to uh, type it in quickly, I'm sure we can uh, we can get to it. I'll give it another minute or two, and then we'll we'll move on if that's uh, if that seems to be the end. Um, maybe I'll just kind of ask a bit of a follow-up. I think one of the things that I found very uh, interesting about your uh, presentation, Dr. Chi, is the, um, some of the progress and maybe uh, that's happening in triple negative cancers or as the basal-like cancer, uh, breast cancer that you had mentioned. Uh, as we've known, there hasn't been any targeted therapies, and it seems like with some of the research that's coming down and some of the trials that that might be changing in the next little while. Yes, and so as I, as I mentioned, the, sort of the, the foundation for now is and likely will in the foreseeable future remain chemotherapy. Uh, but immune therapies are definitely one that is um, of significant interest. So I see there's one more question about genomic testing, which is a great question because um, here, in, here in BC, particularly Vancouver, we have a huge interest, as does other places like PMH, in, in testing. I think that um, we, have, we now have at our disposal, it doesn't mean we understand it all yet, but we have our disposal, at our disposal the technology to better understand the genomic changes having, occurring in an individual tumor. So what, one of the things that we're doing here in, in Vancouver, and I think similarly at PMH, is 
You know, in, one of, in any of my patients that is having, unfortunately, a presentation with stage four metastatic disease, we're trying to get a biopsy of the tumor and doing genomic profiling. So it is feasible. We are getting information. Um, and it's very much, we compare that to what's been reported in the literature, very similar to a lot of the things that have been reported. The next step is taking that information and knowing how to harness or use that information to match the drugs that we have at our disposal to those genomic alterations or changes. And these are best done under the auspices or umbrella of a clinical trial. So we are right now in the throes of this type of concept and question. Um, I think it will. My hope is it will dramatically change how we treat breast cancer in the future. Um, and right now, how it's changing breast cancer today is really as uh, a form or a way to be involved in clinical research. Okay. Great. I think that actually is the last question we have for today. Um, I just, Dr. Chi, on behalf of all the participants in the Canadian Breast Cancer Network, I want to thank you for joining us for this session uh, and sharing with us the latest in metastatic breast cancer treatment. Thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. Please remember that this session will be available for viewing on uh, cbcn.ca. Thank you very much again, and, and good night. Thank you. Thank Bye you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>